Just a short introduction and a few words from me about how the format of these meetings uh, work. Uh, we have a very special guest with us tonight. Uh, t- t- tonight, uh, this uh, today, uh, it's um, uh, Cecilia von Pesky, who is, uh, among other things, a lieutenant of the Dutch Royal Navy. And she has held many prominent positions in international institutions, as well as being on some probably fascinating and important peace missions in uh, many corners of the world. Uh, We were just talking about Georgia, but also, I believe, Afghanistan and other places. And she is uh, well versed in international uh, peace uh, operations and uh, also the theory of them academically. So we are really happy and really grateful to Cecilia that she agreed to to meet with our humble humble group and uh, we um, are very much looking forward to to hearing what she has to say and to to talk to her. Uh, the format of these meetings is unchanged. Uh, we have the speaker talking for up to 20 minutes probably and then the conversation follows which will be mod- moderated either this time either by me or by Cecilia or us together we'll see how it goes and um, uh, you are encouraged to uh, to ask questions, but also simply to speak your mind, to um, share your thoughts that are you know relevant to all of us, and uh, we really welcome your input. <coughs> uh, so please don't hesitate to do that. And uh, I will call you by name. Please use Zoom's raise your hand feature. You will find it when you go to the participants uh, to the participants uh, window, which is. Uh, there is a black bar uh, on your screen that has the option to mute and unmute your microphone. And there you have also the participants um, icon. Go there and on the bottom of the screen that appears, you will see the raise your hand option. Then I can see or the moderator can see that you want to say something. If you can't find it or, or if it doesn't work for you for some reason, you can write to me on the chat or you can just unmute yourself and speak if both of these don't work. So this is how it works. And now I give the word to Cecilia with, uh, again, uh, our thanks. Lucas, thank you very much for this very kind and, um, well, definitely not modest um, introduction, which is very kind of you to mention. And let me, first of all, say thank you very much for inviting me. But also, let me say very uh, right away to start, how nice to be back amongst uh, the ranks of the IARF, right? It's lovely. Um, I'm um, in good contact, not very frequent contact, but in good contact with the Dutch IARF uh, members, which is mainly uh, Witzke, the former, uh, what was it called again? The president of the IARF, right? Not a, a secretary general, president, I feel. And um, so I do feel IARF is close to me. Um, of course, very close to me in my thinking, and that's why I will explain a little bit more about that, but definitely also in uh, in the connection. And I, in that sense, I was also happy to see Lucas, Lucas pop up in my mailbox again. Um, um, and I think it's a high time for me to join an IARF um, physical meeting again. I, I, I don't think the Zoom sessions are bad. I actually think it's really a good addition to all the other meetings we've been having in the past. But it's also good to, to meet every now and then in, in person because you do have a different type of contact. And um, I look forward to it. So when there is another one in 2021, but please do send me an invitation and it will be my pleasure to um, attend. The last one was in uh, Birmingham, which uh, was a very interesting uh, four days. Um, and I vividly remember the discussions we had and also like the working groups with a lot of young people there and with um, the visits to the uh, houses of worship. Uh, it was my first time that I was in a Sikh temple, for example, and it really made an impression on me. So any, everybody who's here today, who was there back then as well, let's remember the interesting and, and good times you had back in Birmingham, Birmingham hosted by uh, the Birmingham University. Um, so for today, 
so when I was asked to come up or to pre like to offer to present a theme to speak about, it did pop up. Well, first I kind of suggested maybe uh, peacekeeping is an interesting one. And then we settled, Lucas and I, we settled on um, defending democracy because I think uh, both themes kind of go hand in hand, but they are both so very, um, you know, this is really the momentum to look at these topics. Um, perhaps for the ones who, do, who don't know me, maybe I may uh, start with a little bit like where did I come from? Uh, because of course that also influences very much who I am and uh, why I, at least to a certain extent, think how I how I am thinking, and um, and it's also my way to to reach out to you guys for, for finding um, parallels between our lives because the mere fact that we're here that we are together forming bonds bonds of friendship but also bonds of professional cooperation through IARF uh, there is a reason I believe that we are here right it's not just a social club there's a reason why we're here and there's an aim we all have with this. So for me, this basically started, well, besides the spiritual level that you're perhaps born with and, you know, like has come from something outside ourselves or something divine, perhaps, uh, that's brought into our souls. And that's why we're on this journey uh, in my, let's say, like just life life, being on a, a human person, you know, being a person on earth, it, it definitely came from the family I, I was born into. So my father was a minister in church. He was a reverend. And in the Netherlands, we have the uh, Remonstrant Church, which was one of the founders um, in 1900, am I right, correctly? One of the founders of the International Association for Religious Freedoms. So this, not my father, but the church was, the co church community was. Because it's a very liberal church, a very, um, I would say, almost at the kind of the far end of that spectrum, of that continuum and thinking very liberal. Why are they so liberal? There's many reasons, I think it, it has to do with being Dutch. The Dutch people were liberal. Um, they have a kind of a liberal tradition, most probably because of being sales, salesmen around the world and you know, having had uh, contact with other cultures from a very early time in history. Um, I wouldn't say it's because they're anything <laughs> better than others. That, that, that I don't think is the case because I think, and that's the basic story here, um, yes, you can in a way be born to be more liberal in your thinking, but you can also really shape people to be more liberal in their thinking. And that liberalism, uh, I would say, is the openness of mind. So I'm originally a psychologist, educational and cultural psychologist. So educational psychology is about how do people learn. So it's not only children learning, but also adults, for example, or how to build a powerful learning environment. So that has to do a lot about how can you form the human mind in such a way that it's open to learning new things. Um, people can be reluctant to, le to learn new things, perhaps because they had instances in their lives that the learning was not such a positive thing. It wasn't reinforced. They were maybe even punished for learning um, or punished in school because they didn't keep up with the others. And then learning becomes something really bad, like you get neg negative emotions. So as a learning psychologist, educational psychologist, I deal with these issues, or I, let's say I used to deal with these issues because this is something I did in my first part of my professional career. And the educational psychology is about how are we the same and now how are we different across cultures. So that's not um, what do we eat and what do we wear. That's more anthropology, right? These are customs and traditions. But it's how we, for example, differ in cultures in how we look at um, power hierarchies or how we look at um, changing different social roles um, in society. Is it in one society, it's easier to change roles, you know, being a, a, prof a worker at the workplace and then being a neighbor in the street. You know, these are all different social roles. And uh, in some societies, it's easier to switch between these roles. And in other societies, they're much more um, compar com in different compartments. So I think uh, both these topics are very important for me uh, also, um, when I connect them to my kind of my religious development and my thinking on religion, um, and definitely that started as ha growing up in that very liberal uh, Christian family with that reverend as a father. Having a reverend as a father also meant that you always had a lot of people from the parish, from the uh, church community visiting our house. And um, I would say it's almost, there were, instances as a child that it was almost like living in a hotel there were always people coming for dinner and 
Sunday, Sunday afternoons, there were always some kind of like meetings that my father was organizing and people would sit in our living room and I would go pass around little cookies, you know, with the cookie tin and offering a cookie. A friend of mine is a, used to be, or he's now retired, but he was a Dutch ambassador to Moscow for some years. And he was uh, the, the child of a colleague of my father. So we grew up both children in the church. And he said uh, once in a speech that um, becoming a diplomat, the roots lay in uh, passing out those cookies to all the members of the community. You know, that you had to be kind of service minded and have to deal with all these different personalities. I kind of feel it, it was similar for me. The other part of growing up in that vicarage, growing up with a father who has such a like um, visible role in society, especially in those years, it was a, really a thing that when you were the, uh, like the town doctor or the town uh, notary or the town um, reverend minister, you had, really had a social um, specific role. Uh, people would refer to it as growing up in the glass house, and that was true. People really looked at, you know, how how the children of the reverend behaved. That was sometimes a bit difficult, but um, I also therefore was confronted with um, the difficulties in life at a very early age, uh, because you saw all the um, social service my father had to do um, because of his profession. I remember nights where, you know, in the middle of the night, the phone would ring and my father would have to go and help somebody who was. Um, just, you know, the police had just gotten this person away from the railroad tracks because he had tried to commit suicide. And my father was there as a first um, responder. Um, throughout my childhood, we also had this um, father uh, coming to visit us almost every week for years and years. Who had uh, He was a farmer and he had uh, accidentally with his tractor pulled back on his uh, driveway on the farm and by doing so he had killed his three children it was an accident right and uh, I mean these things really make an impression when you're little at the, at the one hand it's kind of you think it's normal you kind of think that other families have similar people visiting but when you're growing older you you notice right this is not other families don't have this not all families at least and um, I do think that has really, um, in my case, helped me to, I'm, I'm not going to be the one to say I have such an open mind, but it did really force me to um, yeah, look at different sides of society and see that uh, we, all have, we all live different lives and we all get our own challenges. You know, and some, some people get really hard challenges in their lives that they have to deal with, a lot of pain and grief or you know, difficulties to overcome. Now, um, and growing up, uh, I think for me, I would like to mention, because it might be interesting for some of you as well, I became a member of this uh, youth organization. It's called CISV. It originally stood for Children's International Summer Villages, but now it's just an acronym. The, the name doesn't cover the content anymore because the programs became more diversified. But um, it's an international youth exchange organization but also adults uh, can join their um, programs for adults as well. And um, the basis of it was like, you know, peace, peace through international friendship. Not, not a, a non-religious, non-political based organization. So not like Catholic or something, not like from a political party, just, you know, open and liberal. And that really also um, broadened my horizons. I traveled to many different places for that and, just got to know, like you are, like we are, like you are in IIRF. Uh, you all meet each other from all over the planet, and you have a similar, similar vision and a similar mission. Now that I feel is very important for people, and also especially in the times that we're living in now. Um, and there's the link also to defending democracy. I think for um, democracy to work. And um, we need it to work because it's the best type of um, governing we have at present and also what we've had in years. Uh, in order for democracy to work, you really need to have people who, can, um, who are able to incorporate ideas that are not the same as their own ideas, right? like, like different, you know, different ideas, and also have to be able to reflect on these differences and uh, be able to kind of wrap their minds around visions that are not the same as their own. 
And this skill is not easy. This is not something we're just born with. Or like I mentioned before, like how this developed in my own life. It's not something we, we are just born with. And it's also not something you just kind of learn in school. Um, I'm also, there. I have to be a bit realistic and pragmatic. I also don't know if we can all, if we all have the capacities to learn this. Uh, what we see, for example, and you know, listen carefully to what I, I'm saying here. Don't get me wrong. So, um, but what you, for example, see with people with uh, autism, severe autism, for example, when it's very hard sometimes to um, put for people with autism to put themselves in the perspective of somebody else, right? To really, literally place themselves in the shoes of somebody else, because that's the thing that's um, different with, with people who are neurologically wired in a different way. And um, I'm not saying those people can't be open-minded, of course not, but it could be more difficult to uh, emp- to put themselves in the shoes of somebody else, to have that full emp- empathy in looking at things from a different perspective. So th- what I'm trying to say is that I do think there are physiological, neurological uh, aspects in being a, a human that also can ag- accelerate or hamper this development. And we just have to be very vigilant in looking at these aspects we can't just think like oh you you know as as soon as you are in a international world or something you're a global citizen then it all works no it's and it's also a constant process constantly we have to uh, reassess our own thinking try to see you know really understand what other people's thinking is about try to incorporate that in our own own minds our own frameworks and see how that relates to the world we're living in for me, basically, I mean, there's many tasks why have for us to do in the world and why we're in the world, but that definitely is one of the big tasks um, because this is really kind of scrutinizing your own thinking and building your own um, mental frames. Here's the, the educational psychologist speaking again, of course, right, about um, constructing, building mindsets and concepts. I would like to refer to one of the as very famous quotes of Kofi Annan in that sense as well, right? He said, if the if wars, wars and conflict, if wars can be built in the minds of people, so can also be the architecture of peace. And I agree. And I've also tried to make that um, like one of the core elements of my own life. I think it's a process of building. And sometimes you're really having to do that kind of like by hand, you know, by hand you're building uh, these concepts and frame, frameworks it's like muscle memory. You have to do the motion and through that you incorporate these ideas. So that for that you have to go outside in the world and meet people. I actually think that going outside in the world and meet people really also can be done via Zoom uh, or whatever of these digital um, media we're using. I'm really embracing them. Um, and this is not a topic for today, but just quickly. I feel it's... Uh, I have found a lot more... Um, Kind of a, you know quiet in my uh, in the you know uh, quick pace that I was living that I can do so many meetings um, just from my own home now and I don't have to have this travel time the whole time and getting fatigued because you know, the train is late or you're standing on a, a cold um, railway station or you're having long flights with the airplane or long car rides etc. And uh, so I I really think it can help us to go even deeper in the topics that we want to. Um, discuss. The difficulty, however, is that at the one hand, this has uh, made us more equal because we can all participate in these meetings. At the other hand, it has given us even a bigger gap, right, b- between different people. And that, I think, is one of the, the big threats we're confronted now. You read it in the newspapers. The uh, inequality is on the rise uh, on a worldwide scale. I saw numbers yesterday about Dutch society just as a reminder for everybody, like every society, also Dutch society, it has a lot of challenges. But in the last 10 years, the um, number of homeless people in the Netherlands has multiplied multiplied by five. So there's 40,000, 40,000, and we're only 17 million people being homeless in the Netherlands. Imagine, you know, the country that ranks usually number three or number five on the world ranking for prosperous uh, countries. And that alone has so many people um, who are homeless, often, of course, also due to um, mental illness. But then it just shows we're not able to um, 
supply the care these people need, so the care and support. But uh, so this this global gap is getting worse between the haves and the have-nots, um, and I find that very worrisome um, because having that bigger um, inequality between people, this really um, has um, is a threat to democracy. And um, I will explain you why I think that is the case. So to measure democracy, there's several criteria, right? Um, so this is not, for example, just um, measuring does a country have a parliament instead of a dictator? Of course, this is one of the aspects, but there's many more. For those of you who are uh, very, I mean, really deeply interested in democracy and democracy building, you can look at, um, uh, I mean, there's many websites, but for example, also Open Democracy Forum or Democracy Index, um, or in the Netherlands, and you can, it's an English website, you can look it up. The Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy, they will show you those, those indicators, like how they measure if a country, you know, where, how high does a country uh, rank when it's, um, when it's about democracy. Um, but one of them, um, so of course it is, you know, does a country have a multi-party democratic system? Does it have or does it not have? Um, and you could argue, for example, for, a state, for the case in the United States, that it doesn't have a multi-party democracy because it's basically only two parties, the Republicans or the Democrats. So in, in that sense, you would not rank very high on a democracy skill. Um, but also um, access to education, because education is believed to be a very important element for democratic thinking, basically on, the, on what I explained just now, right? Helping people to be able to incorporate new ideas that doesn't just happen by itself. Uh, I lived in Norway for a few years. Norway usually ranks number three or number four in democracy index, or highest from the top. Last few years, Finland was on uh, first spot. And you see in those countries that rank very high for democracy, they, uh, their educational system uh, is very effective. Um, which is interesting, by the way, for the ones who are still going to school, who are having children who are going to school. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to school many hours. In fact, it's almost the opposite. If you look at Finnish um, elementary school students, they go to school uh, least hours in Europe, but ha ha most effective. You can look at the PISA studies. That's a, um, they, uh, compare, it's a comparative study for elementary school education. So very good output. These children are good in math and you know, arithmetic and in writing and in reading, all these elementary skills. But they, uh, they don't go to school a lot, just a few hours a day. Eh? Very interesting. Um, what, you know, how, how, how come? And then these elements are seen as very important in democracy building. So what you see, for example, in Norway, which I liked, it could be that it's in your country the same, but in the Netherlands it's not the same, uh, that libraries are fully free. You know, you can just go to the library for free and read the books, rent um, videos, read newspapers, because the Norwegian society believes that it's um, only having access to knowledge, access to um, publications, uh, that's what you really. That's what you need to be able to build a, a dem democratic society. Of course, on a side note, just to you know, we have to be, we have to remain realistic. And somebody has to pay for these books, right? And Norway has a has a lot of financial resources because of the oil industry. So uh, of course, not everybody, not every country can afford this. This is another element why we're living in uh, challenging times now. Economy. A glo um, government, governmental economy is dwindling. Our countries are using all their financial resources to combat uh, uh, the effects of the COVID crisis and to keep people financially, you know, on their feet, so that they can pay for their for their rent and pay for their food. And uh, that definitely will have a big effect on uh, the development of democracy. One other element at the moment, which I'm sure you're, you are all thinking about as well, is this, um, I mean, when we look at terms of freedom, freedom in our thinking, freedom in our religion, freedom in our movement, I think that's a very important one. In the conflicts where I 
uh, went to as an international monitor, usually this uh, freedom of movement was uh, was at risk. People were not allowed to um, go to a place where they wanted to go or leave a place where they were at, because, for example, a border was uh, shaped, the, a borderization, so bo a new border where there wasn't a border before, like you see in Georgia or like you see in, U in uh, eastern Ukraine. And freedom of movement really hampers people, right? It hampers you because it might limit your access to education, might li limit your access to justice. That you're, you're not able to go and visit a um, lawyer or a um, ombudsperson or even a judge, or you can't even yeah, perhaps defend yourself in a, a courtroom. So a limitation of access to justice and to li limitation, of course, to access of health, not, not being able to go to... Um, hospital, but also something as, as simple as this, uh, that we maybe sometimes in our regular days are overlooking, but um, access to um, administrative bureaus, right? Um, just, uh, well, it's a little bit macabre uh, example, but it is an important example as well. So I worked in um, Eastern Ukraine for some years in the conflict in the Donbass, so in the city of Donetsk. And uh, we would um, see people standing in line to cross the um, makeshift border, right? This, uh, this de facto border that was being guarded by, um, it, let's say, insurgent groups. And we, we noticed uh, people crossing this border with the, with the vehicle, which meant they had to stand in line for many hours, sometimes in the heat, right, in the sunshine, and then uh, try, hoping that they would have the, the papers that they needed to have. And if they wouldn't have the right papers, they would be rejected at the border maybe even after standing there in line for 10 hours or something. It was a horrible, uh, deplorable conditions, especially for the elderly. Um, but what we noticed sometimes, it's, sorry, it's a bit macabre, but some people had the dead people with them in the car, like the dead grandmother. And then we checked, you know, why is this? Are you, why are you, she's dead. You're not bringing her to a hospital. And the mere, the sole reason was that they had to present her at a, a, a service, a hospital server or clinic, something like this, I don't remember and to um, have it established that she had passed away because that was, and then, so then they would have the official records that she passed away and that was the only way how they could deal with the inheritance, for example, all the financial issues that had to be dealt with and ownership of property. Um, so this was not to just gain personal benefit, you know, to, to get your, their hands on her money, but just, you know, these are issues that you have to deal with so, so they could go on with their lives. This was really very sad, you know, what, what loss of freedom of movement did to people. But also uh, the, the, the municipal basic administration, the, the um, registers for birth, like I mentioned death, but also birth, uh, becoming uh, at age that, you, that you're allowed to vote. If voter registration is hampered because people can't move around, then it might be that you lose your right to vote. Now, in COVID times, all these aspects are limited, uh, or suddenly they were limited, very suddenly, right? Let's say March um, 2020, earlier in the East, uh, Asian countries. And uh, many of these elements have been under threat. Now, the development towards a um, more digital-based society will counter X then. And we are now we were already, but that is just moving much faster now. Uh, able to do a lot of our um, and personal administration and also our work via the internet. So that really, you know, would, would it's it works as a buffer. It makes it, it better, but it also has made that we are uh, have become more isolated. Right, we're all more, you know, in our own home environment. And um, we're losing contact with others. A certain type of contact has replaced it, but we're also losing contact with others. So there's all those sides. And um, I think the most important one at this moment is um, the one on um, perhaps, or let's say the je jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardized uh, privacy, privacy for people. Um, in many countries, I'm sure, but I'm mainly following the developments in the Netherlands, uh, there's talks about having an app, right? And you, the use of an app on your mobile phone that will alert if you have been in contact with somebody who's COVID infected. Um, makes sense. It's a good way to protect ourselves, especially if you're in the you're following the risk group. You're a bit older, or you already have some illness, underlying illness, 
or you're in a country where you have very little access to healthcare or to proper healthcare, it does make sense, right? And it, it can help you protect yourself. And that you could say is a kind of a human right. I mean, it is a human right to be able to protect, to be allowed to protect yourself. So you could argue, yes, there should be this app. And you could even argue, yes, people that don't have a mobile phone and can't protect themselves, they should be given a mobile phone so they can protect themselves. But the whole other side of this medal, like the dark side of the medal is, how do are we then slowly and st- slowly but steadily moving towards a you know on this slippery slope, moving towards a society where every single step we make is being monitored, and if this um, knowledge is falls in the hands of uh, not the right people, well, they, you know, I don't want to be too fatalistic, but basically then you lose your whole democratic makeup, and uh, you lose your yeah your having control over your own life to a certain extent now so i think there we have to be very vigilant um i'm doing so by being politically active that's if you would ever ask me so what then are your recommendations here uh, recommendation one would be try to have an open mind and always reflect uh, none of us has an open mind i don't none of us have we, it's a constant work in progress, we constantly have to work on that by reading, by conversing, by living. And the other one is be very vigilant at the moment in where the, where is this going with privacy and you know state control over the collective, over the society. Where is this going with the growing gap of inequality between people? And where um, and how can you be an uh, active agent? in um, influencing these processes that they, uh, for example, are monitored well, that there's a careful oversight over these processes. We saw this, for example, with the Facebook, or what was the Google firm, right? Um, um, Mark Zuckerberg, who had to um, live up to uh, being accountable in front of the court, and he, and he didn't want to do this originally. And, uh, but we definitely need many more of these mechanisms. Um, okay, so this was a bit of a monologue, <laughs> but there's more. If you, but maybe a little break first to, for me to catch my breath, and for some first inputs, and then we could I could explain a bit more, or, or we already start discussions, or um, yeah. Let, let, let me let me give the word back to Lucas for a sec, so he can help me moderate, and then from there we see how to go on. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, for this wonderful introduction with so many uh, things that we could uh, uh, think about. And um, I'm sorry, I see a few more participants to admit. Yes. Um, So now uh, is the time for you to indicate that you want to say something. Again, it can be a question, but also you may share your thoughts. Uh, please, uh, when you uh, start talking, uh, introduce yourself briefly, say from what country you are and your name. Um, so please, uh, if possible, use the uh, raise your hand option that Zoom offers. If you can't find it, uh, you can write to me or you can just unmute yourself now. I see Wolfgang has his hand raised. Wolfgang, please. Unmute your microphone. Okay. Well, it's unmuted, I think. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, important speech on this Sunday morning, we could say. And uh, I'm an IRF for about 30 years and very much engaged for this organization. And uh, I'm a little bit sorry of one point, not of your speech, but of IRF, that we closed our social network. We had a worldwide social network and we stopped it. And then the general secretary and this time said, we only think about religious freedom, but you cannot talk to, uh, talk to people who are hungry about philosophy. You know? So what do you think? Uh, you mentioned homeless people. You mentioned take back control about your life. Do you think IRF should be for the future reactivate our social network. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, Wolfgang. Um, what is the best here? That some people who have a question, they ask it and I respond, or do we collect a few questions? What is the best thing? 
maybe I can say if somebody wants to kind of echo what Wolfgang said on this topic, you know, social network and the the, the kind of the place in this whole environment that the IRF can take in. If somebody else wants to say something about that or two more people. Yes, that's a, that's a good idea. Thank you. So uh, if anyone wants to add something or to what Wolfgang said or comment on it, then please go on. Uh, I have. So uh, apparently I don't have the days and option because I am the co-host and I couldn't see it there on the screen. Uh, so Cecilia, uh, echoing what Wolfgang said that, yes, in countries like India, wherein we have uh, troubles with our basic necessities, to fulfill our basic necessities, it is very difficult to uh, understand each and everyone's psychology and provide them learning platforms according to their need. Uh, as you said, the education is one of the uh, major defender to the democracy. So how one can do it into demo, uh, like a developing economy like India and how IRF can be part of it or uh, these kind of uh, dialogues can be uh, impactful in such scenarios. Thank you very much, uh, John V. Is there anyone else who would like to add something to these two contributions? We can allow one more person. Well, I have another input in, the, in that uh, we had, IRF had, uh, has been very much active in India. We had a program, women uh, help women or something, they get jobs. No, women can control their own life by uh, earning their own money, yeah? by producing things. This was a women project. It was also supported by IRF. Just one example. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, Cecilia? Please, uh, if you if you want to react. Yeah, so these are these are super important questions because they are you are reflecting on a, on things that are happening globally, but also on where does the IRF stand in this, right? Um, let, so first of all, so I'm a very big believer in democracy. I I'm very much support this, but also I don't have the final answer on. Um, I mean, we need to defend democracy for sure, but. I think we always have to keep an eye open in, you know, in the back of our minds that perhaps we're moving to something, some type of governing that we don't even know yet that it exists, right? We know certain types of governing don't work, like we don't want to work in an in a, uh, oppressive, or we don't want to live in an oppressive dictatorship, like a mit military dictatorship, that we've seen, that we know doesn't help people to feel happy, right? And feeling happy is that is what we want. Not in the sense I'm just happy because I'm sitting in the sun, but happy because uh, all the uh, the elements of the pyramid of Maslow. I, I I have enough to survive. I have I I feel socially connected. I I have the opportunities to develop myself, etc. And that will eventually lead to happiness and fulfillment in life. And that's what you wish for people to have. So, um, but I also don't have the final word in saying, like. You know, I, I'm not going to say like, oh, democracy is the only thing that can offer us this. No, I am open to, and there, I do, I do feel I'm hoping to be open. I'm open to be convinced by, you know, other models. I sometimes feel that um, some type of uh, autocracy, at least some elements of that also could work. And the thing with democracy, it also keeps us back, right? It, it makes that we can't move very fast because always all the opinions have to be taken in. And um, for me, I would say the United Nations is a way of, not in, not in the way how it's organized now, but it's just a legacy that we have from the past. Uh, we should look at the United Nations as an infant, like a very little baby, right? It is only born a shortly, a short while ago, and hopefully it will flourish to become an adult. But there you could almost, I mean, of course it is democracy based because it has a parliamentary assembly, but uh, or general assembly, but it really, it's almost an autocratic man, uh, level in, on a world federation level where you eventually would overrule certain sovereignties uh, by national states. For example, if it goes, if you talk about climate elements, of course, definitely, right? You can't have one, I mean, you all know this, you can't have one country polluting a river where the neighboring country then stuck with the pollution. For that, you need to have something that's, um, is supranational a, a governing system that is above those national interests, and um, so that I feel we that we definitely have to support that thinking. We we, we shall we definitely need to do in this year, right? This is the big uh, seventy-five years 
year for the UN, but also for like Friday was the signing of the UN Charter 75 years ago in San Francisco, which led up to uh, four months later, the ratification of that charter and then the birth of the United Nations. I'm a member of the uh, Dutch United Nations Associations. I definitely advise you to do the same in your own country. Almost every country has a UNA, the United Nations Association. And then you can actively help in uh, supporting basically, mainly, which is what we are doing, the SDG campaign, the Sustainable Development Goals, right? You have them... Uh, you, I'm sure you are familiar with them. I, I have them even glued in my calendar, so I have them always close by hand. I can just look at, oh, yeah, 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 where does this fit in? But the 17 sustainable development goals, that they are you know, they, they are born out of the Millennium Development Goals. Those uh, we focused on between 2000 and 2015. They were mainly, um, that's an interesting, if you, if you if we want to look at that on, in a conceptual manner, because it really shows also how we developed uh, the last 20 years since 2000 that the uh, MDGs Millennium Development Goals so these were made by the UN um, member states right not the UN it's not like Ban Ki-moon or Gutierrez who is making this it's the, the states themselves uh, preamble for the UN Charter we the people so that's you uh, that's Lucas here all of you but also my neighbors and my president and, and my king you know we the people we made these and the Millennium Development Goals uh, were uh, basically um, stating about um, leave no one behind. So the thinking was some countries are there where are already there, right? They're already prosperous and they're doing well and they have a good future ahead of them. And they, they kind of need to pull those countries who are not and the people in those countries, they have to pull them with them, like up, you know, upwards uh, to a, a, a new future, a better future for all. So it was kind of like the richer, better developed countries lifting up those who weren't. That's why the core sentence was leave no bum behind. But now in the sustainable development goals, which are the sequel to the MDGs, the MDGs ended in 2015, and then the SDGs, were launched, they will run till 2030, so also 15 years. We still have 10 years ahead of us, and sh for sure something will come after that. It's not, the focus is not anymore on leave no one behind. The focus is on we're all in the same boat because with uh, climate uh, uh, threat uh, challenges and, and global challenges to economy, we have definitely figured out, and especially also the last few months, that all of us, all the nations, all the people are in the same boat. It's not like one can save its soul over the back of the other, no, like air pollution, water pollution, um, uh, temperature rise, it will affect us all. Um, where could, where does IRF uh, fit in? I think at the one hand, it's a very small organization, uh, very limited in its power. At the other hand, huge, big organization because its thinking is so uh, fundamental, right? Its thinking is so huge and it's, um, that thinking influences the thinking of many others. Like it will influence other churches, it will other social communities, it will influence other uh, like political parties, other nations. And I think IRF, but that would not be new if I say this, should really try to carve out the benefits of being in that niche. I would say specifically social networks. I don't know which, exactly which ones Wolfgang is, Wolfgang is um, pointing at, but I would say probably social media, uh, social networks, uh, but also like physical ones. But just being out there and you know making sure that people hear about your message. I'm, and I'm sorry, Cecilia. Perhaps I can offer a clarification. What yeah. Wolfgang meant was that IRF used to run uh, a social program, so it was re uh, really aimed at ah. uh, providing uh, aid. Uh, to uh, to people who were disadvantaged, and then it was discontinued. I think at the beginning of the nineties. Yeah. Oh, okay. So no, no, that is something that's then really qualitatively something different. Uh, out of the top of my mind, I haven't thought. I, I haven't been able to think about this longer. But just you know, based on my experience, uh, personally, I don't think that is what IRF should be doing because IRF is not a um, professional aid organization. And the delivery of aid, of humanitarian aid and support, is really a, um, I mean, a, that, that's, I mean, yeah, you can make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, yeah, it's not, not professionals in religion either. You know. 
Uh, no, but it's a, a niche, right? A, a very specific niche. Uh, all, and, all we are in a niche, yeah. Yeah, but I think so. Th- I'm not saying like IRF should therefore not do any humanitarian pro- uh, projects. If there is a chance to do so, do it, you know. But make sure that doesn't uh, take away from the core focus. And I think the core focus, and I, I saw that when I was in Birmingham, that there is a bit of a there's a little bit of a clash. I mean, really a fundamental clash. I'm, I'm surely IRF has been able to resolve this. And I mean, it's not really a clash, but yeah, you have to understand the thinking and then, then you start to see this. IIRF is not a community of religions getting together who believe they have the right to, to what they are thinking. You know, like religious freedom. I can believe whatever I want. No, IRF is an organization of people who think religion in some way or another is important or they detect that there is something like religion in the society and that they feel that these religions itself should be open in the way how they look at others and how they treat others, etc. And that element, that is the important element. And that is the message I feel that IRF should always be communicating. It could be communicating this through delivery of humanitarian aid, right? It could be a humanitarian aid project where IRF shows that it's um, connecting with other religious communities or non-religious communities, but having this message. There you have to be a little bit careful, of course, that you don't become a missionary, uh, having to, trying to want to convince the whole world that they should be more open-minded. It's kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to give you a lot of success if you're going to try to do that. And you also basically will make a, make a fool out of yourself. That's not going to work. But definitely it's finding that way how to, how to have that narrative, how to explain and show the world, but also at those fora that, that are of such great importance. I'm thinking, you know, the World Ch- uh, Council of Churches in Geneva, those places where these different religions get together, make sure that to explain the, the raison d'être, the reason of being of the IRF, the belief that religion itsel- itself should be open. And that's a very big statement, very bold. Yes, okay. I, I totally agree with you. Sometimes what I like to say is that there is religious freedom in the sense that uh, I studied as a lawyer uh, uh, concerned with human rights, uh, which is a, a legal principle, basically, or a, a state principle. And something, of course, we all should protect. And IRF does this as well. And we are proud of the work that we've been able to do. And we are hoping to do more supporting minorities and persecuted groups. But also there is freedom in religion, which IRF is there, I think, to demonstrate that uh, religions have the potential to liberate. Uh, And I think this um, goes nicely with what you call open-mindedness and uh, self-scrutiny. And yes, this, I think many of us here share this point of view, but of course this does not mean that we uh, should uh, not use opportunities to help our, uh, our fellow humans uh, in all ways, all ways possible, especially if there is a partnership that can, be, um, can begin. Uh, for, uh, Lawrence Adira is with us, and he's the secretary of the Kenya chapter, and recently they've been doing uh, a great work uh, <clears throat> in the slums of Nairobi, uh, providing uh, providing essential uh, products uh, like sanitary products and uh, and food to people who were for some reason not uh, were missed by the big organisations like the Red Cross, for example, because we all know that there is a problem with the channels of distribution. Sometimes the aid doesn't end up where it ought to. Um, and it, it is something on a small scale, but it is definitely making a difference. And so we are also proud to, to have people like that among us. Um, would someone like to, uh, to say something? It can be, of course, a comment on what we've been talking about, but you can also, uh, uh, refer to a different, uh, topic that was raised by Cecilia or share some other thoughts of yours that are relevant? If you can't find the raise your hand option, then just uh, unmute yourself. Or hold up, uh, you can also just hold up like a post-it memo if you want to speak, something like this. Yes, I, yes I will now, not everyone has video on. Um, I think I heard someone.
I think Dr. Brown is trying to say something, but his audio is not working. Oh, I see uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kirti Sony, uh, please unmute your microphone. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Kirti Sony from Sony College, India. Uh, I want to ask a question. Um, as uh, uh, today's our topic is about democracy and fundamental rights and humanity. Uh, as we know, according to the uh, definition of democracy, uh, that it is for of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, but uh, as we choose uh, the leaders with our own, uh, do they follow this definition of democracy? No, they don't. Very easy qu do question. Yeah, do they serve us with this definition of democracy? As we have right uh, to elect them, and with a, we elect them you know, with very confident that uh, they they all will solve our problems. But uh, is there okay? Is there uh, it is? Is it so? Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's we can be very uh, short and long in the end. So thank you very much for coming up with the question, and I I can also I mean re relate maybe also in your the environment where you're living that you're coming up with this question. But you can raise this question in any environment. Of course, we see in real uh, in, in reality that uh, elected leaders quite often don't do this. It's not like they never do, right? You have good leaders and you have less good leaders. Democrat, democratically chosen ones. And so this is why all those other, so but the, like the, democracy is not only uh, elections and the person who is elected, right? Democracy is about having strong democratic institutions, right? To have, have a very good ombudsperson office, to have a very good uh, judicial system, to have a, also to have a very good educational system. All these elements together make democracy. And you hope that by making these elements strong, and that, that is that sustainable development goal number 16, uh, peace and strong democratic institutions, to um, kind of uh, yeah, safeguard um, democracy, support democracy, defend democracy, and build democracy. But definitely it's one of the flaws of democracy that maybe the, a wrong leader can, can be elected, uh, and then, um, you know, rules for its own gain. But ju just don't look at it as that that, that, that that being the only effect of democracy. There's many aspects to <clears throat> democracy. So if, if I may Thank offer you. a comment, because I don't see anyone else. Uh, I, I studied this topic uh, when I was studying law and um, especially uh, the th modern theory of democracy. And so we came to a point where we no longer um, uh, see a majority rule which means the voting, yeah, that the voters, the majority of the voters choose someone as the cornerstone of democracy. Rather, we see the cornerstone of democracy in certain values that a society, a state espouses. Um, human rights are the, uh, the, the modern catalogue of such values, of course. And uh, we always have um, an opposition is created when uh, a government is formed elected by the people, because now we have an opposition of the ruling and the ruled. And we have a problem because the, the ruling, after the people have spoken and chosen them, uh, are no longer directly um, supervised by the population. So we come up with mechanisms to alleviate this. And uh, one of them uh, is um, judicial scrutiny a constitutional uh, tribunals, for example, constitutional courts, whose role is to test the law that is being passed by the legislative um, uh, and test it whether it complies with the basic values that we as a society have chosen. So the constitution, human rights, and so on. And the courts in this model are something that um, 
guarantees that the majority that is, that has the power will not uh, abuse that power. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. We have other institutions as well, and uh, but this is what we talk about sometimes. You, I think you've be, you've heard the, the phrase as checks and balances, so that there is balance between the free. Um, branches of power, le- legislative, executive, and judiciary, but also uh, in such apparent conflicts like the, the ruled and the ruling. So, uh, Avizka, I see you have your hand raised. I hope I wasn't talking for too long. Uh, my apologies. Avizka, uh, you have to unmute your microphone. That's where I am. No, uh, on the contrary, Lukash, um, you partly answered my question. Uh, maybe I can have a comment from Cecilia uh, because um, I'd like to know. You know she mentioned um, a strong having strong institutions that they have a part to play. Um, about I think, uh, especially in the Dutch situation, civil society is even more important. So, uh, of course, they interact. I can understand that. Could you expand a little bit on that? A very good question, Witske, and I know that is also one of the foc- foci in your work. Uh, I, I would not say one is more important than the other. You really need both. You need that civil society, which is also strong, well-organized, well-educated, uh, well-informed, and you need the strong democratic institutions. And together, that communication and that cooperation will then start. And that gives the fundament to democracy. And from there also, better, good or better leaders can, you know, surface from there. Uh, And that's also basically what you see in in democracies that are run better, according to these uh, indicators. Um, so, so definitely, and IARF is part of this civil society. That's the that's such an important niche for IARF. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, in response to what Witske said, but also the previous speaker uh, or person who asked the question, that um, we have to also keep in mind that there's many different types of democracy, right? But we're now seeing, for example, in the European Union, this is like liberal democracy, right? It's a, a, a form of democracy. But there are many different forms of democracy. You can look it up on, the, you know, just Google and Wikipedia, types of democracy. You will get 200 different types of democracy. And um, what is usually said, yes, it has... so. A democracy to be a good one, it has to have two aspects. It has to fit international standards for democracy. And you can just look this up. What are the international standards for democracy? Uh, elements like um, uh, to have transparency about where the political parties get their funding from, right? All these elements, these are in international standards for democracy, plus homegrown. So it has to fit with that nation. Like what we've seen in Afghanistan, so many years now, 30 years, we're trying to have them have their own um, democratic governing, but it has been enforced on them. It has been put on them from above. It's not homegrown. And you can say it's not homegrown perhaps because, uh, I mean, you can give a hundred types of reasons why, right? They're too stupid. They don't have a a democratic tradition themselves. They don't know how to communicate, whatever. But probably it's an element of all all kinds of aspects, also poverty and and, and definitely not having that tradition. So how, how, you know, it takes... Other countries, it takes them hundreds of years to get to that level. And um, so, but that, it's that whole, it's really a, a theater play. You have to have all those elements together to, to support and therefore defend democracy. Just one element, just one aspect uh, or like a, a different approach, right, to this democracy. Um, it was a, 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 a Dutch author who published about this some years ago, but the, I mean, the idea is not fully new. Um, but just for us, right, to um, you know, shape our brain and f- think of other options that are there. What if you would not have these um, party leaders, and if you would not have like a president and and all these uh, ministers of state, etc. But you would just make um, make sure that you have a, a, a big parliament, right, and then you divide the tasks over this parliament, and you just make sure you have enough people in this ta- this parliament, perhaps like a few hundred, not like just you know, 80 or 250, but or maybe even like 2,000 or something. 
And you do this, you appoint them on basis of a lottery. You just have a lottery in your country and everybody can be uh, not chosen, but you know, your number can come up in your lottery. And when your number comes up, it means that you have to sit in parliament for years. And then it's not voluntary, but obligatory, right? And you can't sell your seat either. You can't say, oh, I'd rather not, you know, because I want to focus on my business. I sell my seat to somebody else. No, no. When your number comes up, you have to. So then you can say the benefit of this, that you you don't have this political wheeling and dealing behind it because there are no elections, nothing like that. You have a very equal representation. Everybody uh, can be chosen, right? And if it's really done statistically well at random, you really do get some type of reflection of the um, society. But on the bad side, well, basically, A, this will, will also cost a lot of money. At the other hand, you can say, well, you don't need elections anymore, right? You just rotate them. So that also saves money. But definitely you can also say, like, can you be confident enough that people who uh, are... You have come up by lottery that they know what they're what they're saying. You know that they're they've they've de- they're developed enough and it educated enough to make these decisions. I'm not saying that only educated people can make decisions, right? Maybe the person with the small vegetable shop knows much better uh, what decisions to take that are healthy for the health, for the entire society. But I mean, this you would we don't have any democracies who are built on this sit on this you know projected system. But it's interesting to think that there are different uh, opportunities. Um, I also, I just want to say, because I was thinking further, I wanted to say something about IRF and um, doing humanitarian projects, right? So, because, so definitely I'm not, and it's also not me to say something about this, but I'm not against it. You know, don't think like, oh, we have such a beautiful project supporting children or women or whatever, and now she's saying it's bad, you know, don't think so. And it also really depends on the country where you are and the environment where you're working in. But you have to be very much, very careful to not try to be a do-gooder, right? That is only kind of to satisfy your own feeling in the end, like you're doing something well for those poor other people and it makes you feel better about yourself. You have to be very careful for some kind of decolonization. Again, it's some affluent religious group we're not all affluent i know but we are probably if you look at it statistically irf members in in a way are more affluent just because they are they have already these liberal ideas and have they and they've come to that point in life through a certain letter that is again these uh, affluent uh, religious groups with a basis in the west who are you know coming to help the the poor and underprivileged like, you know, the white man's burden, Rudyard Kipling's book. And so you have to be very careful with that. And also the sustainability. We've seen many projects in the past with, you know, teaching rural women in Africa how to sit behind the sewing machine and, you know, start a little shop. Yes, in the end, they were able to sit behind that sewing machine. Yes, in the end, they were able to, to uh, you know, pay the food for their children. But it didn't get them anything further than that. It was subsistence. It was, you know, day-to-day living because their income was so little. And it would have been better if somebody would have taught them, like, how to design websites or something, you know, because with that you could make money and you have a much bigger uh, market. So we have to be very careful with this kind of traditional thinking and, and also what is the motivation behind it. Personally, I don't think this is the niche for IARF. The niche for IARF is reach out to... Also, um, religious minorities, the ones also who are under threat, but do it on an equal basis and do it by, um, you know, communication and exchange of thoughts. And don't forget, there's also a lot of liberal, um, open-minded religious communities that are not, um, like, you know, poor and living on the brink of uh, subsistence. Uh, I mean... um, I, I attend services with the Riverside Church in New York, right? They're affiliated to, to the Rockefeller um, Imperium. Uh, one of the um, their ministers in the past was Dr. King, Martin Luther King. I mean, uh, well, you know, if you're ever in New York, go there and see one of their services. It's like being in a golden palace or something. But they're very, very liberal, right? And uh, so there's also rich liberal churches. It's not only for poor, oppressed uh, churches. And um, and maybe even look at other groups as well. I'm, I don't pin me down on this word if I say so because I, I'm not fully uh, aware. But if you look at um, the Freemasons, right? You know, this is a long-standing tradition, and um, but they are also free 
free thinkers. It's not a religion, but they're also free thinkers. And uh, hook up with, not like, you know, not form an affiliation with them or something, but to see if you can have them as a speaker once, or you can go there as a speaker or something like this, and figure out where where do you meet in this liberal thinking, you know, where and where then can you build a network of liberal thinkers that are open to uh, diversity? Because that is definitely, I feel, the future of the world. Yes, thank you very much, Cecilia, for those thoughts. We have uh, three more questions, and although we are running a bit out of time, I think I will allow them perhaps to uh, to uh, save some time. Uh, we will collect them, and then you can respond to the three. Uh, Pedgeman, please unmute yourself. Yes, my question is that what do you think about proportional representation as opposed to first past the post in democracy? And I will mention something else as well. In Iran, based on proportional representation, we have a member of parliament from a Christian faith and a member of parliament from a Jewish faith. In a... That is my question. Thank you very much, Pejman. Pejman, by the way, is the secretary of our British chapter. Uh, Emmanuel wrote me a question. He unfortunately has problems with his connection. Uh, he asks, can universal human rights be protected from becoming the privilege of a minority given existing inequalities between and within UN member states? And now, Janvi, if you could ask your question. Uh, so, um, Cecilia, I just want to build up on what Mrs. Sony was trying to say. Um, uh, first thing is, like in India, when we come to uh, the leaders, uh, the leaders are being elected with the uh, previous experiences or what they have done for the society or what they are promising for the society. Now, uh, there sometimes makes a wrong decisions is being enforced or something. And as you said that it is more of a not a person who is homegrown or something like that. Uh, those aspects also uh, like peeps in. Um, the thing, uh, like the holistic question is, what is a person's responsibility for creating the stronger democracy or the stronger governance structure? Like people like me or people like young people how, what is the contribution they can make to create these stronger economies and stronger democracies so that we can live together peacefully? Thank you very much, Janvi. So this was a lot. <laughs> I hope you made notes, Cecilia, please. I did. I think uh, for Pejman from the UK, uh, you're mentioning one of those. Uh, like, like I said, Google it on uh, Wikipedia types of democracy, there's not only one, there's many of them. Some of them are dodgy, they, they will not work, but some of them are really close to what we're now having and elements of that can be incorporated. And what Pejman is mentioning is one of those elements. Not first past the post, first past the post is you just put everybody who wants to be elected there and the one who gets the most votes gets in, right? And then the number two, number, number three, etc. So basically you could say the one who has most money to run a campaign will have bigger chances to get in or somebody like uh, where other people recognize themselves in, you know, you can you know, you, you identify yourself if that person gets in. So then more members of the uh, majority will be, become elected. But if you have um, representational democracy, yeah, you can say, um, I mean, look this up on the internet, it's very easy to read the uh, explanations. But you can say if we have 10% of Rohingya and living in your society, then also 10% of the parliament should be uh, the seats, you know, 10% of the seats, seats should be for Rohingya. Or you could say we have 50% women, 50% men. We have to make sure that half of the parliament is men, half the men. Of course, it gives a much more equal uh, distribution. And then you could say, well, yeah, one of the big benefits is um, more better representation. So more different op uh, opinions will be incorporated, plus the uh, society including what Witzke said, the civil society, will find more identification with the parliament. So that parliament will also be supported more, right? And a parliament that is supported, a prime minister or president is supported, is a good thing, right? And if it's deep 
thorough and deep support, right? That you really think, yes, this is the person who is doing well for my country, and I will work, to, I will, you know, co co collaborate, cooperate with that person. That's always more beneficial for a society. So yes, page one, and there's more um, uh, elements, right? And it's finding that's therefore constantly shaping to find the best working type of democracy. Now, Emmanuel uh, mentioned the. Um, Oh, I made a note, but I can't read it. A privilege of the minority. Yeah, yeah I, so you were mentioning something about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, uh, so his question was, if I may remind uh, just, can human rights be protected from becoming a, the privilege of a minority given the existing equalities between and within UN member states? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, uh, together with democracy under threat, we have human rights under threat. Um, well, the, the the way how to defend those is, well, basically similar elements, right? You make sure that the institutions that deal with human rights, like a human rights court, or also the, the Ombuds Office, I find always very important um, uh, elements in all these Ombuds Offices, that uh, that they, uh, I mean, that they have ample resources to work with, that the people who work there have received the proper education, that uh, there's a you know a, a thorough and effective communication going from these offices to the audience, so people are informed that there's the checks and balances that Lucas is speaking about. You have transparency. The same for human rights. We have the Universal Declaration for Human Rights to refer to. That's basically the best document we have um, connected to the UN. Basically, not only written, of course, but it was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt who was behind the the, the drafting of the International Declaration of Human Rights, but also there, there are other documents. Uh, there's a um, one coming more from Arab states, um, but that yeah does ha that, that, that does have a few elements that uh, not everybody will agree with. For example, uh, are you could say in a way, but then you have to have an um, Islam scholar to explain that. But you could say in a way it's a little bit less universal. Uh, more ethnocentric, but uh, study it for yourself, look it up. There are other documents, but I would personally, I think the one that's mo most encompassing, most inclusive is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So you look at that, yes, and then you can say, so how, how is this just, is this only, but that's same for democracy, democracy, is this only a dream um, for the privileged? Uh, I think we are at a, st at a state in the world now that we, really need to ask ourselves, yes, is this a state for only the privilege? Um, I hope not. My world view is not, of course, that it should be, but there's other elements at the moment that are um, putting us, confronting us with such big challenges that you could wonder, yeah, is, is not, for example, having an autocracy uh, better, at least for the uh, challenges we're having now? And then I'm mainly looking at um, having stable as, and secure um, having a security situation that's stable and economical situation that's stable, overpopulation and climate. These are the elements where people have to have to be able to live in safety. They have to be able to make their make means either by you know um, generating an income through work or by a universal basic income. And the right that you're born also gives you the right for economical survival. So you would get a basic income that at least covers your basic needs, overpopulation. Sorry, I'm quite um, radical on that. We have to lower world population. Sorry, stop having kids. Sorry, <laughs> really, really, it's, I can't say more than that. And um, and the uh, climate, like uh, we have to, um, and with that, with, with slower, had uh, a slower pace democracy sometimes has, and the harder it is to uh, keep having support for democracy, etc. You could wonder: Are we moving fast enough? If uh, if uh, we've all been reading this week, 42 degrees in Siberia, the permafrost melting. I mean, this this is humongous. You know what's happening there. And if you look at uh, harvests in, uh, I, I read a prognosis this week. This was not like a prognosis in the sense like it's going to be like this. But you know, if these elements fall out of place, then that prognosis would come real. If the uh, these uh, crickets, these grasshoppers eating the harvests in Africa, and then the 
harvests um, not you know not the, grow, the crop not growing because of climate change and the migration. It could lead up to scenarios where you have three hundred thousand, three zero zero thousand deaths per day on the African continent. Now, I mean, people, what are we going to do if we're getting to that scenario, right? And um, so, um, yeah, so maybe we need. A, but don't quote me too much on this, but maybe you need some autocratic governing that really deals with these issues, right? Because they're too big. I mean, we wouldn't be able to handle them. And then John Beam at the end, very smart, uh, very in intelligent lady, all of you, but also John being a younger generation. Um, let's, uh, I think there, yours was more a statement and a very wise statement, what you mentioned. And I just wanted to mention that at the one hand, there was a critique to the leaders, maybe even to your own leaders in India or so. But then at the other hand, India is one of the oldest, if not almost the oldest democracy in the world. So that's very interesting, right? It's, India is always put forward as an example there. Homegrown democracy means it has, it comes from the people, right? It's not enforced, comes from the people. And if it's such an old democracy, you could say, yes, well, theirs must be homegrown because it really comes from the people. That also comes from British uh, colonialization, of course, but also from the people. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Indian democracy. My hunch would be, but you guys can discuss this amongst yourself, that that homegrown part is also the, the traditional um, caste system, right? That made it more difficult. So that might bring forward sometimes not the leaders that are good for the country because it's homegrown, because it comes from your own tradition. So then that would be something to um, break through. And uh, how much, how far is a person's responsibility? That I think, Jan B, really only you and every individual can answer for yourself. I think that's the basis of our belief, right? And that's also, I would say, most people at least, and I, I find them in the IRF, because we do have a religious big background. Most of us, I think we believe in, God or a certain type of God. That's kind of why we are in a religious movement and not only in a social movement, uh, whatever type of God, right? But we do believe that there's some kind of a divine, divine, um, divine influence. And I think then, that, yeah, that, so that's a spiritual call. Um, do you think your, your, your reason of, for being on earth is that you work on these topics? Or do you think it's... Um, Sometimes there's other challenges in your life and you don't have to, right? Um, so th that's really a personal call, but very interesting personal question, which you have to answer for yourself in, com in co communication with others. Right? Either you go as a recluse, as a hermit, as 30 years in the desert, and then you have the answer, or you communicate with others, and that's how you find the answer for yourself. Uh, to just remark on this, uh, I believe that when it comes to uh, India and when we talk about the casteism or the groupism in terms of the communities uh, being uh, like being bifurcated based on religion or based on their way of worship or something like that, uh, that is more of a dividing in nature in today's scenario. So if I if I talk about the youth, most of them they refrain themselves to fall into this pit because it is not leading them to the religious, actual religious path. It just, they are making, uh, they are like actually uh, separating themselves from like to with the others in the peer group. Maybe if I have to define myself as I am a Hindu and if I'm in a group, maybe I will have a different way of uh, like, I will, I will face some kind of consequences of it. And that, that mostly would, would be negative because the way the media is working or the way the people are believing the thought process and things like that. So the actual meaning of the religion is not reaching to the masses. And that is something which is more challenging because uh, when you're talking about uh, like uh, inner engineering kind of thing, you need to learn more and you need to be really, uh, really known to the facts to their core, to their roots, and this this is something which is missing, and it, it and it it doesn't happen with one or two lectures with the students or the conversation with the students or the young people. Uh, it should be hammered. It should yeah. be it should be a continuous programmatic kind of process to do that. And where sometimes we I think that uh, we we are not able to do that ourselves, so uh, people fall off. 
I have nothing that's wiser than these words. So I would use this as a final statement. <laughs> I like the internal engineering. I like that as well, because I think that's what we're doing. That definitely, I like I said at the, at the start of this session, that's, I think, is my personal responsibility. I also believe, of course, I need to be there for others. Um, but I also think I have to do personal internal engineering. That's my, uh, my uh, responsibility, like the task I have gotten in this life. Right. Yes, we are very blessed with Jan V and the whole Indian Young Adult Network. They've been doing tremendous projects and uh, relentlessly with, uh, with the little means at their disposal. And we are all in awe of what they've been able to achieve. And we are trying to support them as we can. Uh, thank you very much, Cecilia. This was a wonderful, information-packed, very intense meeting that I'm sure everyone will be able to take out something off. Yes, <laughs> um, but uh, you gave us a lot of things to um, to research, to look up, to uh, to uh, dig deeper, and um, for that uh, and your presence, I thank you sincerely. Um, and everyone who's been with us, also, thank you. Uh, it's been really, truly great. Uh, as always, I will ask you, I will type the address in the chat. Uh, please go to our website, which is irf.net slash poll. And if you have a few minutes, please uh, fill in a survey about these meetings where you can give us ideas for future topics and uh ways to improve the experience so please especially people in india we haven't had many uh submissions from you please go to irf.net slash poll the address is in the uh in the chat and fill in the survey um thank you everyone who's been with us and who's asked questions uh the following meeting will be in two weeks with professor kamar from uh, uh malaysia who is a scholar of uh, uh women's studies and islam and uh, we are also very much looking forward to that meeting. The details will be published tomorrow.